folks. Uh, it's It's been a while, and uh, we have a very special event today. Uh, today with us, I have uh, Michael Muller of the band Balmoray, which started in 2006. Michael is one of the founding guitarists. Uh, today, specifically, we're going to be talking about Music Matter Jazz, which Michael has been a fan of. Uh, along with us is Jeremy Elkin, who is an independent filmmaker. Uh, he's been doing some wonderful uh, independent films. Uh, he's been working with Vanity Fair magazine. Uh, more recently, he did a documentary um, which combines the hip hop and skateboard skateboarding culture in New York City from 1987 to 1997. And, and Jeremy, what what is the name of the documentary? All the streets are silent. Uh, All the streets the are silent. Uh, he's also a big Music Matters jazz fan, and he's just recently been getting into it. But today, specifically, we have two of the founders, Kevin Gray and Joe Harley. Uh, and we kind of want to have them talk about their experience in the founding of Music Matters Jazz. So to kick things off, uh, Joe, uh, for those that are really not familiar with Music Matters Jazz, can you really talk about what was the drivers behind it? What were some of the influences? Because there really wasn't anyone doing audiophile jazz reissues per se, with the exception of classic records. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could talk to that a little bit. If if classic records was an influence, was Rudy Van Gelder's CD reissues an influence on that? Can you can you speak <laughs> to that? Rudy Van Gelder's CD reissues. Yeah, uh, they might have been a negative influence. <laughs> 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 because they had a definitely a mixed uh, reception. Uh, and I, like a lot of other people, I uh, got some of those when they came out. Um, but the results weren't, um, you know, there was a compression layered onto compression. And um, so they, those particular, that series wasn't, um, received really well and i i didn't particularly care for them either to be honest um nothing against against rudy don't don't get me wrong but just the approach they took um sonically um i played a few of those and put them away and stuck with the originals i have because i have tons of original blue note pressings um but as far as the founding you know, Ron Rombach, um, who owns Music Matters and was a um, uh, highly involved in the rare record market for some years. And he he that name, Music Matters, was the name of his company and, and we just carried on with it. But we started to talk about doing um, a, re a reissue series focused on Blue Note in either late 2005 or early 2006. And um, I had known Michael Cascuna, who of course is uh, one of the key figures in the history of Blue Note, um, had helped him a bit in the past with um, some of the mosaic um, reissues. And so I contacted him, I thought, you know, the chances of successfully doing this with two guys that um, Capital EMI at that time, EMI owned Capital, Universal owns it now, Universal Music. Um, but I thought the chances of two relatively unknowns um, successfully getting a licensing deal were dim unless we had someone like Michael Cascuna in our corner. And so we started talking to him. And initially, um, we thought our goal was, uh, well, early on, early on, we thought, hey, what if we got Rudy to do these? And um, and it was Michael, I think, that told me, if you've ever talked to him, you know the sound of his voice. He's like, yeah. Harley, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um and he was Rudy wasn't even using his lathe I, I didn't know that at the time but he wasn't um cutting records he went digital before. and never looked back <laughs> that's right he wasn't interested in um in vinyl 
so, but we thought that we would try to, to the best of our ability, make them sound like the originals. That's all we knew. And, um, and we went in with that sort of an attitude. And I'll never forget um, the first two titles we did. Um, we did a Horace Parlin album called Speak in My Peace, which um, to this day is one of my favorites, maybe because it was the first, and an Art Blakey record called The Big Beat. Okay. And we put those masters up, and I looked at Ron, and he looked at me, and we knew we'd never heard anything on our originals that sounded like those masters, that the masters were bigger and more dynamic. And we were hearing things we'd never heard before, you know, records we thought we knew stem to stern, front to back, knew them in every way. And we put up the master tape and it's like, oh my God, listen to that. Uh, so our goal changed on the spot. And uh, we talked to Kevin, you know, Kevin hears masters all the time, but um, we had, we didn't. And um, so we said, God, you know, if we could get this, that would be amazing if we could get what we're hearing on these tapes onto lacquer. That would be very exciting. And so the goal changed on the spot. And so, that, so what was your connection to Kevin? Specifically, why why did you go to Kevin and Acoustech? I, I'm curious that that he's background story. <laughs> Say again, because he's the best. <laughs> um, There's no we, denying that for sure. <laughs> we well, had been we, working together had, going back to about 1997. Okay. Yeah, we we had done. You know, I ran the AudioQuest music label for um, well, the entire time it was around, and um, and then I had been doing some projects for Chad Kasim. Um, and I believe the first thing we did together, Kevin, was one of those records. One of the it was blues, blues records, right? I don't remember which one, but it, yeah, we it, there were a few. Might have been Jimmy, Jimmy D. Lane, maybe. Maybe, yeah, you might be right. It was either that or Hubert Sumlin. I, right, I, right, yeah, yeah, that was about the same time. But um, you know, we we sort of we hit it off right away, like the way Kevin hears the music and the way I hear it and this, you know, his monitors. Um, I say this all the time. My system is quite different. I'm looking over here because my rig's over here. Um, but the way he's got his rig voiced is um, almost identical to what I get here. And so, you know, from a mastering standpoint, <clears throat> if you're the producer, that makes you feel really comfortable because you're you're wearing the same pair of glasses, sonic <laughs> glasses. And so I I recognize that um, from those first sessions. Um, they work with a lot of different mastering engineers, but I remember very specifically thinking I feel right at home. Uh, working with Kevin, and and those first titles that you did were sort of, um, I mean, you were just going off of, you know, your music, you know, your history with the originals, right? And you started yeah. picking titles that you felt, you know, sonically sounded at a certain level, um, or was it like, like, did you start year by year the list, sort of like you do with the Tone Poet now, or was it more loose? You know, it was pretty organic. Um, I'm um, a chronic list maker anyway. And so I had lists of blue notes um, for years before that, just my favorites. And I don't, I'm always making lists. Um, but as it became more evident that we were going to get this deal, um, then it really got serious. So Ron and I, every night we would be, what are you listening to? Well, I'm listening to these two or three. What are you listening to? Well, I'm going to listen, you know, and we would compare notes and make um, our our first list of what we were going to submit to license. 
And you're talking about playing the tape or the original or both? Um, I'm not sure. You were were listening. We wouldn't get the tapes until until they were licensed. Yeah, yeah. They don't send you the tapes. No. Uh, no. That that must have been very difficult to decide what titles you wanted to go for first. Oh, God. Yeah. (laughs) When you're first starting. Oh, wow. You know, it was um, there's so many great titles that um i never have looked at it like a closed system Um, you know to this day i get questions like why don't you you, you've never done this one what is it you have against this title (laughs) and i always say nothing i love this title but you have to understand you can't do them all at once The, the logistics just don't you know, um, you can't put out a hundred records at one time. Yeah, uh, the, the the two different series. I, yeah, I mean, you have like nine hundred or so classic, outstanding titles to choose from. I, I totally understand that. It does well, seem it does seem like you were fairly intentional with balancing the spectrum of if you're doing an organ one here, the next one's a trio, or the next one's a, a sextet with you know three tenor saxophonists. It seems like you sort of we're thoughtful in the balance of the titles you in yes this. yeah and that carries over to today if i've got one that um is particularly um on the adventurous side whether it's avant or whatever you want to call it um because i love all that stuff too i'll pair it with something that's a little more down the middle um just so you know, you don't, uh, you may not relate to this one, but you're going to dig this one or vice versa. Um, yeah, we try to balance it. You know, curious, Kevin, for you, uh, in the mastering of these, do you feel like you had a sweet spot when you started getting in the flow of these? Like you could, you could really know what to do exactly immediately without thinking about it for a certain ensemble or a mixture of instrumentation, or is it kind of more of a, a broad general thing just coming off of Rudy's tape. I'd say it's a little bit more by period, you know, I mean, first you got the monos, then the transition to stereo, then the transition from Hackensack to Inglewood cliffs. Um, And uh, and there were, yeah, there there were a lot of different things that happened in different eras with Rudy, but yeah, we've even a couple of years, let's say into the music matters, we kind of knew what to expect when we put a tape up. There were very few big surprises, you know, knowing what era it was recorded in, where, et cetera. You know. Can you talk about some of the challenges with a title? So let's say you hit, you do 10, you do 20, and then you hit one where either is it, is it that, you know, there's cover art missing? Is it there's too much tone on the tape or something? Is there like a, a signal issue or it just doesn't sound as, like magical as you thought it was or like what are what are some of the issues you ran into early on with some of those tapes or just or they wouldn't play those were no no we did, we've never had a problem with that the, well maybe one or something but but yeah th- those problems are very few and far between you know i don't remember having um any where we went oh god this is unusable sonically you know that that just didn't happen that i can recall um wow. now you know joe can speak to things where maybe there was missing session photos or that sort of thing. That's a different issue. Well, so the Blue Note archive, including the tapes and the um, photos and the album art has been, thankfully, or we wouldn't be here talking today, has been (laughs) very, very carefully um, curated and maintained over the years. Um, You know, even even the tapes themselves, you know, um, the way they come in, um, you've got Alfred's handwriting on him. It there's a certain finished, finessed look to what they have. Where I know for sure, Kevin, you can speak to this, but um, you get in other labels, and Prestige, and some of these, and you didn't have an Alfred. And oh, the so, writing is so sparse on a lot of those. Sometimes they don't even put the artist's name on the box. Yeah. Wow. On Prestige titles, not mm-hmm. uncommon. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's maybe really, they couldn't decide who was supposed to be the leader. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's really quite quite different. But um, no, fortunately, all the tapes, all the artwork, the photos have been um, 
very secure and very carefully maintained over the years. So those tapes are kept at Iron Mountain, is that correct? Or yeah. back in the day? That- well, there's there's several Iron Mountains. So uh, most of the Blue Note stuff is at Iron Mountain in Hollywood. In Hollywood, okay. Um, so it can get it can come to the studio at Acoustic or Coherent um, within a day. Oh and yeah. Ob- obviously, in the early days of Music Matters, you were at Acoustic which is adjacent to RTI. So that was an easy drop into the tank. Uh, yeah. As far as moving over to Coherent, would the, would, the, would the lacquer be immediately shipped over or the following morning or something? How did that work? We sent them first overnight. So, you know, we cut them one day and then they get there at 8.30 the next morning. Got it. That's nice. And then the night before I write to um, Doran Sauerbeer, who, is the, who runs plating at RTI, and tell them, you know, in the morning, you're going to get these four. Heads up. Heads up. Um, and he knows. And then I copy everyone on the Blue Note team. <laughs> <laughs> and I do it. He knows what it means. It means, so get these in <laughs> right now. Right. right. You know, and he knows. He yeah. Knows. And he's real good about it. Yeah. Um, Go and so... And so when you started Music Matters, you started with a 45. Mm-hmm. That went until, just for the record, it went until 2015, 16, in there when you switched to 33? I think it was 2014. 2014. As I recall. Yeah, and- I don't recall the exact, um, it kind of runs together, but there was a point in time where, um, you know, 45s were... A big thing at that time and we you know there are some advantages to cutting at 40 45 but there's disadvantages you know now you're talking about two records instead of one and you're breaking up the original flow of the track order so there's you know there's pluses there's minuses and after doing uh i think a hundred and twelve I think that's right. Sounds right. about right. Yeah, 112. Um, then we decided to um, to do a few 33s, and we and then we we were doing some of the titles that Chad had done on 45. We did at 33. We weren't going to do them again at 45 because what's you know what's the point? In the Chad's uh, Blue Note series, which Kevin was also cutting, yeah, overlapped with the the Music Matters as well, right? Yes. Um, we actually started first, and then um, I believe Chad started releasing three or four months later. Might have been a little longer than that, but it was a little bit later. There's a separate license on the 45 versus the 33. That's correct. Mm-hmm. Got it. So um, was there a time where there was some confusion about who got what license? And Yes. <laughs> Okay. We, do we want to talk? Probably don't need to talk about that. If we, if we, if you don't want to talk about it, that that's fine. that's up to Joe. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think it was only on one title, as I recall. Um, Monin. Yeah, and leeway. Oh, right. Leeway, um, but mostly not. I mean, mostly we we just chose different titles different stuff yeah and it sounds like you with your relationship with chad already i mean there hopefully that relationship still remain good and yeah yeah we i was, I was just doing both yeah okay yeah. um so when you went over to, to 33 and a third was that more customer driven and more to pick up the titles that you couldn't do in 45 i think at that point you know we've been doing 45s for four or five years and um you know the aesthetic re, re, regarding 45s was beginning to shift a little bit you know okay. where people were really um excited about it and that I, I include myself i was too um but at a certain point you know the the getting up and down uh, not that <laughs> not that most of us shouldn't get up and down more than yeah. than we do um it breaks the mood though you know yeah yeah and i i had a phone conversation with ron 
I think back in 2014, and he made the comment that a lot of the customers were complaining about having to get up and flip sides. And honestly, I I like the the sonic clarity of the the 45s. Yeah, Kevin, I mean, they sound great. Yeah, yeah. Kevin, for to to someone who doesn't know um, about cutting and how you know how that whole thing works, can you in like layman's terms, can you describe? the differences in cutting a 45 versus a 33 from a technical perspective? Well, if you're talking about the sonic differences between the same thing cut at 33 and 45, uh, it, it's all a matter of curvature, you know, particularly on the inner grooves. You're not going to notice that big of a difference on the outside of the disc. But as you get towards the inside, um, you have more curvature uh, at 33 and a third, you know, because it's it's turning slower, you know, I mean, it's going 33 to third, but when you look at a constant angular velocity format, it's it the 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 wiggles are tighter together uh, at 33 than they would be at 45. Are kind of spread out at 45, and so there's a sonic advantage. But you know, it's I wouldn't say it's huge. Um, Is there also an advantage to having more space on the physical? Well, yeah, because you're cutting it down to like eight or 10 minutes aside, you know, um, even though 45 takes more space inherently than 33 with sides that short, you're finishing a little farther out too. So, yeah, there's that. You know, the other element in here, um, because I, I have 33s that we did that sound better than the 45 of the same title. And the reason for that is this other element Kevin can speak to, but his system changed. It went through a significant change, significant yeah, around 2012. Change. Yep. Um, I I basically completely rebuilt my console and um, put in a different uh, tape machine, which my former business partner and I had built. And um, basically, the electronics that I was putting in the new console was stuff that was taken out of my older console that uh, was still owned by FutureDisc at the time that I started up at Acoustech. So I didn't have access to either the tape machine or those electronics, which included the equalizers. So um, the only thing that was really the same with my old system and the new system was the cutting electronics. Um, but the console and the tape machine were different. And when I first moved, well, I, I bought the equipment back and it sat outside of the room in acoustic because there wasn't enough room to put it in there. And so I never made an AB comparison between the two. And no sooner did I move into uh, coherent, uh, I had room for the tape machine and I took the console electronics and basically it was all wired together with an umbilical. I wired it all together and hooked it up to the tape machine and just kind of went, whoa, <laughs> it sounded so much better than what I was used to hearing. It was it was shocking. So, yeah, so that I it, it's, it took me almost a year and a half to get all of that interfaced into my new console. And um, and, and, and that made a big change. You were still amid the 45s only at that point, the 45 RPM. Yeah, we were doing 45s only at that point. It was when Ron had me cut him an acetate at 33 because he wanted to see. And, and so I cut an acetate at 33 of something that he already had a 45 pressing on. And he said, man, the 33 blows the 45 away. He goes, I don't, <laughs> I don't see why we're beating our head against the wall, putting out two record 45s when we can get this sound with 33. So, and uh, yeah, that's the other, that's the other wrinkle in there is that Kevin's system um, evolves substantially. Right. And there was also there was a further upgrade. We had put AudioQuest cables in up at Acoustic, but we upgraded to the newer ones, the Wild Blue and and some of that mm -hmm. um, at that time. And all of these things synergistically improved the system. I was always curious who named all those Audio AudioQuest cables. Joe, is that <laughs> uh, Bill, Bill Lowe? Okay. I always got a kick out of those. Yeah. Um, so Kevin, what what year are you talking here? Twenty. It's after 2013, 2014? After 2012, yeah. Got yeah. It. So it might have actually been 2013 when we started the 30s. I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, I'm a little fuzzy on it, too. See, the other thing, too, is there was a big lead time between the time we mastered and the time that Music Matters stuff came out. So that makes it a little even more confusing trying to figure it out. <laughs> how, how far ahead? I know, Joe, you've, you've said in interviews that you're about one to two years out for tone poets was it about two and a half two oh and it half. wasn't that long for the music matters but it could have easily been six months to a year yep wow 
So um, I, I'm curious, were there any that you cut 33 and 45 at the same time? Oh, well, they could listen to the to the uh, Chad's 45s and then compare the ones we were doing at 33. Ah, uh, okay. So, yeah. Uh, going back one step, in the early days when you got a 45, this was slipped inside the mm -hmm. jacket, um, which is great. Tells the whole history of how it started, the impetus, um, stereo versus mono debate, the, the gram weight of the vinyl. And then you get to the next page, it talks about the jacket, and there's a list, early list of the titles you... Some were already out by this point. Right now, there's 64 on here, and mm -hmm. I've counted five or six that never made it. <laughs> uh, Benny Green, some Lou Donaldsons, a couple of Lee Morgans, uh, Jackie McLean. Can you talk about some of those titles? Um, those maybe were on your list, and the tapes didn't work out, or no, no. Um, you know, honestly, it's a lot simpler than that. Um, we would hear something and get excited and um, and just arbitrarily make the change. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it had nothing to do with whether a title was worthy or not worthy, or we just, you know, you'd hear something and go, oh man, I, you gotta go play it. I just played it, you gotta go play it. I'd forgotten. Ron would go, yeah, oh my God, it's great. Well, let's stick that one in, <laughs> okay. And you know who's going to stop us, right? So um, it Part really had it was a it bit was, of a shuffle. Yeah, it was really more like that. There wasn't some grand scheme. You mentioned Benny Green, um, that didn't come out there, but you might see it. Um, you know, it's be more trombone as a leader. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it's it's. Uh, didn't come out then, but it could very well come out um, soonish. In the future. <laughs> That's yeah. exciting. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I think, Paul, you and I both have the, the Hobson's, Gr Grunman's cuts of the classic versions of those, Soul Stirrin' and Back on the Scene, so that, that would be... Yeah, yeah. I, but I, 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 would, I would be delighted to hear it done through Kevin. Because I, I think Bernie's approach was a little bit different from Kevin's. And, and so going back to it, Joe, uh, you know, I, I love the Instagram videos that you've been doing for the Tone Poets. And I know that you have an original there for reference. Mm -hmm. So are, I'm curious, what are you guys listening for in the original cut when you go to the, the new cut? Because you're not trying to duplicate what Rudy Van Gelder did. This is a new thing. But are you trying to extract some of what Rudy did originally? Hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, that master tape is what Rudy did originally. And True. so that, that's what we're that's what we're going for. You, you know, I mean, Rudy, one of the things he didn't like about LPs was um, I think if he were alive now, hard to say, but if he was around and he saw what has happened with the development of turntables, cartridges, playback systems, um, that we can cut, we can put the bass that's on the master tape, we can not use compression at all, which we don't. And, um, you know, occasionally you run into someone with a turntable that's either not set up right or whatever. Right. But we don't cut to the lowest common denominator, we don't. Um, we assume that the person who's, you know, forked over 38 bucks to buy it, um, has a decent and properly set up, um, system. So, you know, we don't have to think in terms of those compromises. Rudy did. He hmm. did. And you can see it in the cutting notes. Um, so listening to the original, is it more to see, hey, I can really improve it here and there? Because, yeah, like you said, you, I, they had to cater to the tables at the time. They did. Um, it's just, you know, it's just honestly, a reference. It's just a reference to see. Yeah. Do we spend a lot of time? I mean, I I do when choosing titles. Mm -hmm. I'm listening to those originals a ton. And I do, you know, there's times I think, gosh, you know, here we've, we've got a, a B3 session, you know, Babyface Willet session or or Big John Patton or Jimmy Smith. 
And um, boy, there's not a lot of, you know, bass on here. And, you know, if you're listening to groove music and B3 driven music, if you don't hear the bass, that's kind of a big deal, you know? And, and then you put those tapes up and there it is. You know, it sounds like that person playing a B3 in front of you. There's pedals. And there's pedals. And even though they're mostly playing with their left hand, but, you know, um, but it's, it's coming out of the bass, you know, it's playing the bass. And so, you know, we put that on because that's what he recorded. And I always look at it like if you saw these cats live, you would for sure hear the, hear the bass pedals of the B3, 100%. And, you know, you have to take a perspective. So my perspective is I want it to be like those cats are in the room. I want to hear it like, like, the guys are there playing for me and not, I don't get so hung up on, Oh, I want it to sound like the old record I grew up with. Mm -hmm. That is fascinating to a lot of people. And I, and I get that there's two different aesthetics here. Um, and we understand both, you know, we understand yeah, both. Yeah. not like one's right and one's wrong, but no. you know, have a point it's of different. view. No, so, no. It, mastering is an art. And personally, I, I like, your your aims and trying to get the most off of that master tape and get that onto the vinyl versus having to make compromises and dealing with some of the compression they had to deal with. I have a question for both of you, uh, Kevin and Joe. When those were those music matters first started coming out, what was the two two part question? What was the reaction from the people buying them, the fans, the music listeners, and then the second one, which is a little more interesting, is what was the reaction of the artists who are still alive and the estates of those artists? I heard a rumor of Freddie Hubbard coming into your studio to hear a record cut. I don't know if that's true, but I mean, people like Lou Donaldson or Wayne or these people that were alive, did, they, did those music matters get into their hands? Did they have any feedback? Or Rudy as well. Well, let, let me just set one thing straight there. I worked with Freddie Hubbard back in 1975 or 76 uh, yeah. when I worked at Artisan Sound. That wasn't part of a, a tone poet or blue note uh session actually yeah yeah freddie freddie never came to a music matters or tom poet or classic session got it um you know um most of those guys of course were gone um horace silver though when um when we did song for my father we sent that uh i think as i recall we did this through his son Horace was not um, going to be around too much longer, wasn't feeling great. I think he was living with his son. And um, he didn't play the record because he, uh, the son or wherever he was, they didn't have a turntable. But he, um, see, I'm going to get emotional telling mm -hmm. the story, but he um, opened it up and, you know, felt felt it you know, and looked at the pictures and, and he, he just started crying, you know, cause he couldn't believe this had happened or that someone thought, you know, this music warranted this kind of presentation. And so that's the only time I'm leaving out some stuff, which it doesn't, doesn't matter, but he, he was very moved. But it wasn't because he played the record, because I don't think he had a way to. Uh, at that point, I don't think they could. They were able to do that. But tell them about Ron Carter. Oh yeah, well Ron Carter. Um, so Don has the relationship with Ron Carter, but uh, Ron made it very clear when we were doing tone poets that um, he wanted them, and. Um, and especially anything he was on, but he basically wanted them. So Don arranged to get a bunch to uh, to Ron Carter. Um, you know, another thing, Kevin, I don't know if I've mentioned this to you, but Charlie Watts, um, of course, Don, Don was producing um, The Stones. Mm -hmm. And when Charlie was, was still around, uh, Don sent him a complete set of tone poets for his birthday. Awesome, because um, I know he was wow. a jazz nut. 
one of yeah one of his last birthdays um i think he lived for another year or two after that but yeah i just that, that's special yeah it is <laughs> i mean that i mean aside from their the artist's personal connection uh to that time in their life just as a listener just a casual fan of jazz the object and the presentation of music matters um I, kevin i was telling this earlier before we started recording that you set the bar the, the full presentation, Kevin's mastering, the packaging, the pressing, the plating quality, everything was, you've set the standard to what now has followed in this big vinyl boom in the last five or six years. And um, what are you saying? People are copying us? <laughs> <laughs> you mean like me? <laughs> With my <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> they also. are. Uh, but it's just so it's, you, this, this record is such a beautiful relic and such a, of an art object that aside from this, you know, the music being wonderful, that it's this piece that someone can have the rest of their lives and pass on, you know, it's, it's quite special. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so many, uh, well, setting the bar is great because I think we all get a better product in the end, but you look at what Chad is doing now, intervention Re records, ORG, yeah. They all kind of copied that that style, and I mean, we're I mean, music matters was the, really kind of the start of it all. But uh, you know, you mentioned mosaic, and I didn't think about it. Did Michael Cuscuna have any influence on the the packaging or the design? No, um, no, but he had a lot to do with um, our getting the deal mm -hmm. at that time with EMI. And, um, and of course we had the arrangement with him, um, uh, for the photos. That's so, it. so can you talk to, you know, what was the driver behind the design? Who, who came up with that? I mean, cause it's, it's fantastic. I love seeing the session photos. You know, we, um, we had a lot of different layouts, um, that we were looking at and, um, and we kept coming back to this one, which is the one you know so well. Um, yeah, I look uh, the other day. I was kind of went back and found some of the original designs. Some of them were you just laugh now. It's like <laughs> you know, photos one here, one yeah. here. You know, trying to be arty, but it's all messed up, in my opinion. Um, but uh, no, we we went to that, and when. Don um, approached me to do something similar for them. Um, he made it pretty clear that he, well, he'd made it clear for a long time in other videos that he really loved the Music Matters uh, reissues. I mean, there were signs everywhere. I mean, when you went into Capitol Tower, um, they didn't have theirs up because they were doing the 75th at that time. Um, Michael, Michael needs to go full screen there because he's showing. I'm, I'm yeah, Michael. Just, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which you were ruthlessly consistent with, which I feel like is such a beautiful thing that <laughs> followed through into this new age. Um, oh, always with one big one on the inner left and yep. then the one set here on the right of the other players. Must be a Grant Green record. Matador. Oh, Matador, killer. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of leads us into questioning the titles that were you you recreated or you created originally, you know, like Matador, Gooden's Corner, I believe is another one, maybe mm -hmm. um I believe there was a T Tina Brooks one, maybe that you created these new covers for yeah. me. Lee Morgan. Oh Lee yeah, Morgan. Tom Cat, Tom Cat. Um, and we do it all the time with um Tom Potts as well. So so are you, are you having to get clearance? How how, how does it work with the with the license of the? Of the you, you mean, or the, now for, or then? Maybe in the music matters days. In the music matters days, it was all by license, and uh, with Tone Poet, it's not licensing because we are Blue Note. So yeah, I work for Blue Note, so it's not. There's no licensing to do. But um, but yeah, we would get licenses for both the photos through Michael and um, the right to release the music through EMI and later Universal. I think what Michael's asking here, Joe, is 
you probably had to get special permission from UME or or whatever to do a new jacket for an album that didn't have a really nice jacket, you know, like the Japanese issues and so forth. Yeah. You know, it was it wasn't a big hassle at the time because um the only jackets you know, a lot of those had come out in what were known as the LT series, which were these attempts at doing sort of arty jackets in the in 1980. That um, I have a bunch I can pull them out, but they're the white ones that look that have a artwork, you know, a, a painting or something or a photo actually. And you know, I talked to Kaskuna about it because um, that was his program. He's so glad we're changing it. But at the time he did those, ECM had just come on the scene and they were doing these very arty jackets mm -hmm. and they, they do to this day. And so it was his attempt um, to do something along those lines. And, but he's very happy that, um, that we've moved, that, that we're changing and making appropriate Blue Note style jackets for those. Um, I have a question for both of you about quantities. Um, the 45s were done as editions of 3,500. The oh, 30 2,500. Sorry? 25. 2,500. 3,500 for the 33s and 1,500 oh. for the SRX, right? Something like that. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, SRX might have more to do with um, the number of jackets we had on hand. Mm. Right. And so it was a thousand, just for the record, it was a thousand for the subscribers, right? Roughly. Yeah. And then the rest went to retail, mm -hmm. music website, distribution, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, were there instances where it was like a maybe a less popular title where you did produce less of them or a more popular title where it it pushed into five thousand plus, or is that was that never a thing? Well, no, on the 45s, no, they were, we couldn't do, I mean, we, the limit was 2,500. So that was the contractual limit. Mm -hmm. So it was, yeah. it was pretty strict, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was my dumb idea, to be honest. Um, I thought that would be, you know, an upper ceiling and, you know, maybe we didn't know, you know, Chad had his prestige program at the time and um a lot of those at that time age as huh the age as series y yeah um yeah so and he did i can't remember the number of titles but a lot of those be 25 were, and then i think it went to 50 and maybe even more I mean, I might have even wound up at 100 i don't remember it yeah kept, it, it kept expanding yeah but those um he did a thousand in those days and um you know sometimes it took two or three or four years to sell them mm -hmm. in those days oh how things so are. i thought 2500 well that's you know i mean we'll be lucky if we ever but but you know we can we can put 2500 out if we have a real hit well as it turns out um they all for the most part sold 2500 and so, you know, I I was like, damn, I should have said 5,000. But we just didn't know. We didn't know. So, yeah, 20, it was just 2,500. That's all we, you know, if we said 2,500 and we didn't go, well, let's do 26 and sell an extra 100. We didn't, we didn't do that. It was 20. Were, were you ever sort of, because back then you were doing roughly the same as the Tone Poets now or less? It was a little less. Oh, Tone Poets are can, now? Now you're doing 24 tone poets a year, right? Oh, 24 titles. Yeah, I thought you meant quantity. Uh, 20, 24 a year, and then uh, there can be special, you know, box sets or that sort of thing on top of that. And Music Matters was 10 to 20 a year, or some years more. Uh, let me look at my. Uh... I guess what I'm getting at is is because the quantity has increased with the popularity and vinyl over the years yeah during the era of you know music matters 2008 to roughly 2020 let's say um 
were were the discs being hand checked were there was there like more of a um a human presence than there is now where they're they're being you know put out in a quantity that's like impossible to verify or or you know i know it's yeah. rti but rti is QC is pretty 10 dark, years yeah. ago yeah that didn't really change it doesn't you know i mean we're on the the great presses out there um the qc and attention to detail was the same um you know those I, I I can't speak to what they do for other labels. I do, I don't know. For us, they um, they take a lot of care in examining each one. You know, does someone sit there for minutes on end? No, it's you know, check with a bright light, and flip it over, and check with a bright light. And it's funny when you're out there because you'll see them and just toss it into a bin. Mm. You know, and you see it a lot. You know, those bins are full of records and, you know, people are, oh, I, I take them, you know. <laughs> but, um, but they just, they toss them into a bin, they punch out the um, the center, you know, and those eventually get melted down again. Um, and that doesn't matter if you're pressing 1,000 or 2,500 or 10,000. It's the same process. Kevin, in the, in the Music Matters days, uh, especially at Acoustech, were you getting evaluating any of the test pressings or was that only Joe and Ron doing that? That was Joe and Ron. I, I mean, occasionally I'd get a test pressing. I actually got on the list, so I was getting test pressings for a while, but I didn't really get involved in the uh, analysis. Got it. So it, it, Was there any time where you uh, test pressing didn't really pass the quality test and you had to do a recut? Yeah, when Kevin screwed it up. <laughs> <laughs> not very often you know there could be um well kevin you can speak to there there can be many reasons some of them have nothing to do with uh, not with kevin i mean i'm sure in the plating some things can get screwed up yeah. plating and pressing yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. you know jo joe's real um shall we say anal retentive about having them on center <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I am. that's a big one um i'm with then, you joe <laughs> <laughs> well, i am too that's i'm kidding him but um but yeah and you know occasionally you can have non-pill fill problems or what they call stitching and you know all these things happen on pressings they just they just do and there have things in the press have to be reset they have to change the cycle slightly or the temperature right. slightly or whatever to make everything work that's the other funny thing about test pressing selling for thousands of dollars on on eBay. You don't know if that's a accepted or rejected test pressing. Right. That's always made me laugh. It's like, uh, gee, maybe I just single handedly dropped the price of test pressings on eBay. We'll see. <laughs> well, well, Hobson has been going crazy with uh, the classic records test press. He has a couple of eBay sites where he's just been offloading them. And you're right. You don't know if it was a one that passed or one that that failed. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I the price say, is the same. Yeah. You know, with with Blue Note, um, I mean, we would never sell a test pressing that was rejected. It, it doesn't even compute to me that that would happen. I can't speak for what anyone else does, but but we yeah, we wouldn't we wouldn't do that. Um, Has that ever happened with a specific title where you get all the way to that stage and and you and you don't release something? And we don't release it? Yeah. No, you would do a recut. Um no. no. You've always you've always troubleshooted, yeah. I wasn't sure if it was like, you know, I don't know, a something that was uncuttable or something. I don't know. No. So so Joe, I I'm curious. I don't know how well this is gonna come out on Zoom. So this is one of the test pressings, yeah. and I see the the plastolite. Yeah, were all your all your test pressings done with the plastolite label? That's pretty <laughs> cool. Um, yes, and um, you know that was, of course, that's an RTI test pressing. But um, but you know, being the uh, crazy kids that we are, <laughs> we thought you know we would do a replica of the. The Blue Note test pressings, which looked like that because they were pressed at the Plastolite company. 
Yeah, so, I, I like the homage shout to out the old tribute. Plastilite company. <laughs> yep. You know, for a while, um, if you look carefully at the dead wax, um, we had Kevin scribe in a, a P. Um, yep. or the, the P ear. ear. Yeah. <laughs> I know there's, there's different slight maybe ideas you had that didn't fully come to fruition. Um, one of the things that I am curious about, I was looking at eBay the other day and saw a Sonny Clark leaping and loping on blue vinyl, which I wasn't aware that was. I don't know if that came into full production, uh, but there are certain titles I know. There's blue variants. Speaking true, of evil. true blue, I think um, we did a. Those were very small runs, but um, true blue and as you say, leaping and loping. Midnight uh, blue. Yeah. Um, are there any others that you experimented with color-wise or even moving into the SRX that I know there's there's rumors of indestructible that was done in SRX that there's only a handful that were made that didn't go into a full production. Is that correct? I don't remember. You know, a lot of times on the SRXs, um, the number that made it onto the market had a lot to do with how many jackets we had left. Oh, I see. So there wasn't a strict adherence to a specific quantity on those, really. Got it. And you were, you were, Joe, sorry, you were still at Music Matters. Did it over, did it overlap with you beginning Blue Note, like with Wayne Shorter, et cetera? Was it, was it, were you still working on SRX titles? Like what, talk about that transition. No, at that point, um, no, I was, um, there was no overlap. And the SRXs, you know, that was using the same mastering and the same um, stampers and all that. It's just a different formulation. So I, I, there wasn't anything for me to do. The art had already been created. Um, it was simply using a different formulation. So um, there was, wasn't there about a, two or three year gap in between music matters and tone poet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was, there was definitely, you know, things that pretty much wound down. I mean, the last years of music matters were basically, um, just doing some SRX titles, uh, titles we'd already done before. Was there a gap between the end of the 33 standard edition and the SRX series in time? I don't remember. No. <laughs> yeah. uh, just trying to get this get it sorted out for the the nerds out there watching <laughs> um were, were there was rumors maybe floating around the internet of music matters delving outside of blue note for possible titles or runs is that anything either of you know about well we did um inquire in fact i think they approached us um about getting involved with um, impulse titles. But, you know, as we looked into it, um, you, we ran into this the same issue of, you know, how have these things been stored? Where have they been stored? And when you get to um, that group of labels, um, they're not in the same place as Blue Note at all. Um, and you guys have probably heard about the infamous fire, you know, on the the lot, and some some were stored there, unfortunately. And so, as we learned um, that some of those masters didn't exist, we we just thought, oh, hell with it, you know. We we don't want to get into because um, we'd never had to deal with that before, you know. We 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 live in a in a world where. Um, the same messenger comes and um, all he has to do is drive from Iron Mountain in Hollywood to Kevin's place or in the old days drive from Iron Mountain to um, RTI and um, and you get you get the master. So, you know, getting into a situation. Yeah, we got kind of spoiled. Very much. <laughs> so, yeah, when I started to inquire about various titles um, and you'd hear uh, not available not available, not available. And I'd say, well, why is it not available? Um, we don't have it. You know, they didn't want to get, fire was not a word that anyone wanted to use. 
Right. It was later that we learned why they weren't available. And so anyway, long way of saying we we passed on that. So Kevin, I, I'm curious because you were you were doing work for Chad at the time, but the Japanese also approached you about their uh original master tape series. And you were doing these at the same time. So you're that's, you're doing blue disc, notes for for three yeah. different companies. The disc union series? Yeah, I think it, I think these were coming from Disc Union. Yeah. So you really became Mr. Blue Note, and <laughs> yeah. Um, so so do you think Music Matters was really kind of the driver for it all, and the Japanese hearing some of those and thinking, hey, we got to get it get some skin in the game too. I would have to say yes. Interesting, and that that kind of moves into another question I had going back to. You're doing the stuff, the blue notes for Chad. You're doing the disc union stuff. You're doing all the music matters stuff. Um, now the tone poets and the blue note classics. You're doing these same titles over and over and over again. Seemingly, there's some titles, that, you know, Sidewinder. I know you're a Lee Morgan fan. When you're cutting, that's you've done that now, what five or six times? <laughs> Probably, I I've <laughs> lost count. <laughs> From those, especially Joe, you've been there in there with him cutting cutting these for the different series. Is there any change? Are you using the same metal parts? To, are you even recutting it completely? Oh yeah, it, it, they're, they're all being recut. Joe and I never ever go back to my previous notes. We always listen to each title fresh. I Occasionally, I will go back to my old notes, mostly just to get an idea for levels. You know, if I'm cutting a 22 minute side or whatever. But I I rarely use that as a Bible, you know, for this is the way I cut it before. So this is the way I'm cutting it now. Um, yeah. So there could be very subtle variations. There are, yeah, there, there's variations. Uh, now, if, if I've cut something in the last three years, two or three times, that's probably going to be the same each time. I'm just talking about something that I did in 2004 or 2012, you know, versus to now, you know. Um, I wouldn't necessarily. Uh, and, and it's a different yeah. system. Your system has changed. Since That's then. true. That's true. I think it'd make for a really fun A, B session <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to take the, the five or six times you've done Sidewinder and compare them all. <laughs> I'll leave that to you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've done that. <laughs> and, and I would trust what you'd come up with, Paul. Yeah. You, you're um, very thorough in your uh, analysis I, I may have to try that out sometime <laughs> well the kevin i mean you can sp i don't know if you want to get into this or not um but the disc Scotch? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the disc unions are different in other ways too oh yeah i yeah. mean there's a fundamental thing that is different can, yeah, can you they're... can you explain what what what's different there well it, it i kept you may not have to but i i can. kept it under wraps but it has come out since that they were cut from very high res digital Ah. Um, and they were, I think the people, there was talk that it was from CD. No, it wasn't from T. Oh, there was no. talk that it was the RVGs. No, it wasn't the RVGs. Uh, I think most of them are flat transfers of, of the mono master because that whole series was mono. So it's either a flat transfer of the mono master or a flat transfer of the stereo combined to mono. And, and that's what they did because that's what they want to mess with. They took those from the tapes they had, right? Yes. Um, oh, yeah, 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 right. So it wouldn't, yeah, I sh when I say master tape, I guess I should say the Japanese master. Ah, so so we're we're getting into another MoFi type situation here. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was kind of before everybody was worried about the whole analog versus digital thing so much, I think. Yeah. Um, well, regardless, I... I so it is funny because I, I was talking to Ron about this one uh, probably about six or seven years ago. And, you know, I was begging him. I'm like, I, I want a Music Matters of this one. <laughs> and, and Ron said, no, I'm not going to do that one because you could hear the PA in the background. So at least that's what he told me. OK. He wasn't a fan of the sound of it. And maybe it's related to, you know, the photos, not being able to get some of the, the photos from the time and having the complete package. Can you do you do you recall? No. OK. My I mean, memory gets really Blakey, fuzzy on stuff that far back. <laughs> Blakey Live is um, you know, Kevin. And I talk about this all the time. You know, the tape tapes that Rudy was recording with. You, you know, 
I mean, we, you have to admire what he did because he's working Absolutely. with faith formulations that have very little headroom compared to what we have now. So think about it. He's in a live gig with Art Blakey. And Mr. Art, Basher. Art yeah. and Rudy fought like cats and dogs for years. You know, Rudy would say, don't play so loud. And Art would go back up there and just beat the <laughs> shit out of his drums, you know, in response. He'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to play louder. And so what would happen is you, you get, you know, overload. You know, the tape, Rudy didn't like tape hiss. And so he cut hot. He always did. Um, so you don't hear much right. hiss on his records. Right. But you do hear occasional overload of this or that because he's walking it right up to the edge. Mm. And then you get. No, I don't. I don't have the Bohemia one and two of Blakey that you guys did on Music Matters. Is that present on there, or does it sound more like a studio recording? In terms of like the lack, like is there a lack of hits, or does it feel like a? So my uh, opinion, Cafe Bohemia sounds better than Night at Birdland. Um, and maybe, maybe uh, this is just speculation on my part, but maybe Rudy took some lessons learned <laughs> from a night at Birdland. I don't know. I mean, we, we hear it, um, you know, pe people will nitpick the record sometimes in the Sonics, but, you know, Kevin, and I hear you, if, if you really want to, you know, put a microscope on Rudy's recordings, we could put up just about anything and say, yep, right there. Do you hear that? Little bit of, you know, and you can hear Rudy going for the fader because <laughs> somebody came in hot. And again, these are live two track. There's no yeah. mix. You're mixing as it's going. So, you know, you'll well, why, did, why didn't we fix that in the mix? We hear that a lot. Yeah, there is no. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you can hear Rudy um, going, oh shit, you know, and pulling the fader down. And so for that moment that, whatever happens lee came in too hot on the mic or whatever art bashed the symbol i love that i, I love the that. we yeah, yeah we, we, we've come to just accept it it's just it's, yeah. it's, it's what happened that day i mean that's his that's his craft i mean that's amazing yeah that's what i meant more is like when it's a you know quiet studio session at rudy's versus a like a Bohemia, for instance, I guess, because I just don't have a reference point. I don't have those. I've obviously heard them digitally, but I've never heard the the Music Matters. I wondered if it was similar to a studio. I got to correct you, though. I don't think there were any quiet sessions at Rudy's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those yeah, cats heard, were playing, man. <laughs> you heard Free For All lately? <laughs> yeah, Free For All. Yeah, that's a really dynamic record. Yeah. yeah, and isolation going on back in the day. Yeah, one of, one of my personal favorites of all time is this one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and the the title track I'm sure <laughs> must have been challenging for Rudy. Yep, <laughs> but that's a standard, you know. I mean, yeah, I, I think that's uh, as typical of the Blue Note sound as any record, you know. G going into music matters and the full run. Distinct titles. Do you know the number that you did? Um, we, Jeremy and I have both tried to figure it out. Um, distinct titles. I mean, you know, it could be done 45, 33 and SRX, but distinct titles somewhere in the 130 range. Does that sound right? Do we know? I oh, think it's closer of, to like 180 or something. Am I wrong? Um, I would have to take a look at that. It's, um, that could be right. more like I'm going to say 150, but I I'd have to go back and um, look at the lists and figure it out. <laughs> Got it. Um, one white whale in in that in the whole series is the Duke Pearson Wahoo album, which uh, Jeremy and I have about half of the run of the Music Matters. Paul has every single one, including Wahoo. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a great record. This is one that we hope uh, comes back into a, a reissue series at one, some point. I don't know if that's in the cards, but. Oh, you, you know, um, it wouldn't be in my my in the Tone Poet series, but um, but it could very well end up in classic. Um, you know, he's got Jim, who's dear friend and um, co-worker at Blue Note. 
um, he's got, a, I sent him a list of everything we ever did. And so, you know, he draws from that pretty extensively. And I, what I would say is if it hasn't come out yet, just be patient. <laughs> Was was Wahoo? Um, were there less made of certain titles like Wahoo, for instance? Because we've noticed how there just seems to be a lot less availability of certain titles. Um, especially was it Wahoo? The happenings, Bobby Hutcherson. There's a few where they're just sort of impossible to actually get a copy. Um, I, do you I know, know where they- some are? <laughs> Can you repeat that, Joe? Sorry, I missed it. I said, I, I know where some are. <laughs> um, yeah, there'll be, um, you'll see something coming up here. There's a significant number. And um, you'll you'll start to see some. I mean, they they were what were made at the time, but um, but they're basically, it was it was my allotment. Oh my gosh! Okay, <laughs> off camera, please. You'll you'll tell us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> off camera. Okay, I will. And, and Joe, so my my memory is kind of poor, but you know, I was I became a subscriber, I think after I think the first year. Uh, but w- when did you know you really had a hit with Music Matters? Because I think as as the years went along. I think the momentum really started to build and, you know, I started to talk about it on YouTube when I first started my channel years ago, but I started to promote it to other guys. And I had a bunch of people that were trying to pull old titles and it just became impossible to find them. But when did you really know that, Hey, you know, things are really working with a label. You know, it took a couple of years and um, a lot of word of mouth, all this YouTube phenomenon of, you know, all you guys commenting on records that that wasn't um, really in play at that. Or there's probably somebody doing it, but it wasn't like it was now. And um, and then, you know, we noticed at a certain point that they'd all they'd all go and yeah, they'd all sell and it didn't matter it's like tone poets, you know, they all sell about the same. It's not like, you know, there's a dog title that just doesn't move. Um, you know, it can land in distribution in different ways, but from the standpoint of the label, they're, they're gone, you know? Um, so, you know, it doesn't mean the store down the street might not have some, we never know, but, um, but no, they started to all sell. And you both- that's when I felt like an idiot because I'd said the number 2,500 thinking, oh, that's a, that's so many records. That's yeah. Cool. <laughs> and I was like, God, what an idiot, you know? <laughs> well, it, I, I would say like after the first two or three years, that's re- really when the, the vinyl resurgence started to kick in. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and honestly, I mean, I, I really didn't get back into vinyl until 2010 and Music Matters was one of the first few that I, I managed to to pick up and I, I i think i saw them advertised through acoustic sounds and I, yeah. and then i got hooked and i was i got on the subscription list um so yeah i i, I think you guys really got caught in that boom when when vinyl really started to pick back up and now i i can just see the tone poets easily selling out in their first runs because what, what is it, uh, the the Chet Baker, you've had to repress two or three times now? It's astonishing. Yeah. It's astonishing. I mean, Joe, drew- if, if, if I'm right, if you had done a license for 5000 you would be committed to pressing and selling, well, at least paying for 5000 right? It's not like you could have had a license for 5000 and only pressed well, 2500 so you know the the way the licenses um for us worked is that there would be a minimum okay. and it wouldn't always be the full 2500 but it would be maybe you'd have to pay for half up front okay and um so but still there was a, a commitment chuck a change yeah yeah and i ron ron made the comment to me that you know getting insurance to get the tapes out was yeah, also yeah. a major factor yep I'm which still you don't have to deal that. with now. 
Yeah, yeah Kevin that, deals that, with that. That's on me now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's on you, Kevin. <laughs> well, of course, you got to take care of the tapes, but well, yeah. it doesn't just it doesn't just cover the Blue Note tapes. It covers all. Ta- it, it, it's it's a rider in my insurance policy for the business. Ah, okay. And so do you have the same courier bringing these tapes to your studio, Kevin, and all these? Two, yeah, two two different couriers every time, a woman and a man um, that both work for Iron Mountain, I believe, or maybe maybe they're UME employees. I don't know, but no, yeah, Iron same, Mountain. same two every time. <laughs> so do, do you know ahead of ahead of time what you're cutting that day? Oh, yeah. And yeah, we know when, exactly when they're arriving, you know. There's a guy named Jack Arenas over there that we deal with who's really, really good. And he's put together some things for us that we probably would not have been able to do without his help. So yeah. and and so, yeah, he, he, you know, a lot of communication and right on it. Do they, do they bake those tapes when needed at their own discretion? I do. I, I do the baking if it needs to be done. Back, yeah. back under Capitol and maybe when the tapes are still at the tower, they bake them. But I don't think they have that capability there at iron mountain and kevin we, we talked about this before but there was a certain year where the 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 scotch formulation changed and you're having to bake those tapes more than in previous years is that is yeah my it's correct yeah i mean that doesn't apply to the blue note stuff so much but yeah it actually was it was ampex tape that the formulation changed around 1974 and so tapes have to be baked after 74 you know that are ampex so of these 150-ish Music Matters titles, do you do either of you have these in your own collections as like an archive of that of that series? I, I do. Yeah. I mean, if 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 Kevin got a copy of every album he cut, he you'd have to have uh, his own. <laughs> I'd have to have three more houses. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin, I'm I'm gonna make your problem worse next time I see you. Oh, yeah! I like the sound of that. <laughs> I, I like I like the sound of being able to say it. Uh, awesome. Do either of you two have any, maybe a couple titles in the front of your mind from the Music Matters series that just completely bowled you over that you're maybe that that you loved already, but they made you fall deeper in love by hearing the full full expanse of the frequency spectrum from the original tape. Wow. Um. Yeah, that's that's a tough one, Joe. <laughs> I'm always, you know, um, that first time we went in. So Horace Parlin speaking my piece, um, the big piece. because it was because we went in with one idea, and that idea went out the window five minutes after Kevin put the tape up. Um, it was such a eureka moment and everything changed. So that one's special. There's a bunch, you know, those records with Donald Byrd and Pepper Adams, um, Catwalk and, oh God, there's, there's well, well, Lee, Lee, yeah. Lee Morgan, uh, Sidewinder, I guess for me and, and Tomcat, those two Tomcat, yeah. were just um, two of my favorites. Cape Verdean Blues. I'm looking. Oh, so, you know, yeah, that's that's, that's a great one. Yeah, that's my second favorite uh, Horace title after a song for my father. I talked these guys into doing song for my father. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you did. I love that record. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> Me too. And Joe, I I loved your story because um, really, I, I didn't really get back into or really didn't get into Blue Note until about 2009, and one of the first artists that I delved into um, was Horace Silver. And Horace was still alive at the time and he had his own website and he was doing signings of things. And I sent an email and I wanted to get one of his signed autobiography. And his son wrote back to me and said, hey, dad's not doing so well, uh, but he thanks thanks you. And uh, his son did manage to send me a signed CD, but just getting your backstory was was wonderful because I'm happy to hear that that Horace did get to to see and feel one of these things. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was a very special day. What's that song? It's it's like in my top ten jazz standard. Pretty eyes. Is that a uh, Cape Verdean? Cape Verdean. Yeah, Cape Verdean blues. Um, yeah, no, the song. The song. It's, I think it's called Pretty Eyes. I just oh. love that song. 
Happy, happy to look. That's on the turntable. Yeah, pretty eyes. Yeah. Pretty eyes, yeah. Yeah, we all got yeah. Man, that is that is a great record. I haven't got mine in front of me, but I've got it. I don't have mine either. <laughs> My records are all in the other room. Anyway. So what is uh if you can speak to this, what is we've noticed Music Matters website is still around, obviously. There are a handful of titles that are still there and for sale what's what's the current state of that do you have any connection with with it's going on right now are, are you fully out of it joe and uh oh, i mean i talk to ron every month um yeah as far as um i mean blue note isn't really licensing to anybody anymore because we've got three series going now and so there's no um there's yeah they're 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 we're not licensing to anybody and um and i'm usually the guy that has to explain why not when people try and so the it, mobile fidelity something else was done like years ago right mm -hmm. uh the deal was done um a while back and um but that's that'll you there'll just be that one you won't see more mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course I did that for the classic series too. Yep. Right. So, so what, sorry, Joe, you were saying hmm? that that will be the only one um, because it, you know, they sat on that for a long time, but um, that's a that's a one-off. Which sounds common for MoFi. They they'll announce something and then sit on it for years. But yeah, we were all kind of curious if MoFi was trying to get a licensing deal to do the the forty fives. No, nope. No, it's just a a, a one time thing. Got it. And so, in terms of the current stock and the current state of the Music Matters site, I mean, there's even more. Michael and I noticed there's um, more titles that went up. I think yesterday or two days ago. Mm -hmm. So those, you know, what what is the current sort of operation there? It's really just Ron, Ron and his um, wife. Got it. So, so once that stock's gone, it's kind of finito. Wow. All right. Yeah. Get them while you can. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. You gotta, you gotta grab them while they're there. Cause they, they are, you know, th those are wonderful sounding albums. And I mean, it, it's really what brought me into the whole jazz fold. I mean, I, I owe a lot to, the music matters label because if it wasn't for it i don't think i would have delved into the blue note and i wouldn't have gotten into jazz as much of I, as much as i've gotten into today mm -hmm. that's that's great that's really that's great to see yeah so we're about at the the end of our time here but i just wanted to you know ask you guys in summary i mean what are your your takeaways from those years uh, Kevin, I mean, can, can you talk about, you know, some of the, you know, sum it up the, those years with the label? It was all good. It was all great. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I was honored to be able to, to work on those titles. That was, that was my major exposure to Blue Note. I mean, I, I had a few, you know, mostly CDs and a couple OGs, but, um, as, as I mentioned before we went live, you know, um, Lee Morgan was a big, discovery for me I, I wasn't really familiar with his music and and now he's one of my favorite trumpeters so yeah it was a it was a thrill to do that stuff you know people um ask do you, do you get you know does it get old or does it Kevin can tell you and like I get excited every single time we're we're going to be working together in, in a what week and a half yeah yeah. We do in a few days and I get excited every time and those tapes go up and it never gets old. It's, it's always like, Oh man, listen to that. Yeah. You know? and, I agree. and then you get excited about capturing it. And, you know, I'll tell you when, um, when I get a test pressing, um, it's usually the last time I play my OG. Mm -hmm. um, because at this point, you're, you're, I'm so used to hearing what the compromises that had to be made. 
during the 50s and 60s when these OGs came out that um you know the tape spoils you it's like that's what i want to hear i want to hear that and so the closest i can get to that is um is when the test comes in and then when production comes in that's that's really exciting cuz you the jacket and photos and all that but uh but you know there there are people that um they don't want to hear about that it's like oh gee, no man i want what came out you know what Rudy cut, the way he cut it, that's what I want. I always say that's great too. Yeah. You know, happy hunting. It's it's um if if that's what winds your watch, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like you said, there's no right or wrong. It's just no right you get wrong. a certain nostalgia for a certain sound. Yep. And I and I can attest to that, but you know, sure. for for me, I do have some OGs, but Really, it's music matters and tone poets. That's all I really listen to. You want, it, you want some OGs? I've got like <laughs> <laughs> hundreds, probably. God, I don't even know, but lots and lots and lots. I think a lot of people that criticize, um, you know, modern reissues like Music Matters, Tone Poets, a lot of people haven't even heard one. They're just stuck with the OGs and they might have never even gotten the chance to listen to one on a great system and have that reference point i think you know i think uh, you're probably and, right and and there's there there's some psychological aspects to it too you know if you chase the og for years and years before all this other stuff happened and you probably paid a fair amount to get it you don't really want somebody messing up your party you know saying <laughs> nah, you really want this one for 38 bucks that one you spent 500 to get i believe me i i get it i totally i understand yeah uh, fi 500 dollars for a good scratched up record yeah. <laughs> which i don't yeah. get but, but you know it's like that was the original thing that you know there is a historical right my wife is always saying um you know, you never play the OGs again. Why don't you sell them? And I can't bring myself to do it yet. <laughs> it's weird. It's weird. I don't play them, um, but I'm not ready to let them go either. For I, I can't. There's. I can't explain it. I, I, I can respect. I can respect that because I think yeah. I have nine different copies of something else and <laughs> eight different versions of moaning <laughs> and my wife will look at me and say why do you need all the copies of the same record i'm like well they're different <laughs> why why do you need all those shoes yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> well thank you both for what you've done um over over your careers it's 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 going to outlive us all so um we're just grateful for the work and the passion that you poured into this and you know there's nothing better in life in my in my mind than listening to music and it making you feel more alive and it enhancing just the, your outlook on things and the way you feel and like there's there's nothing else that powerful in the world that i've found so thank Same. you all Same. Yeah, yeah thank you yeah yeah, yeah. I, I personally I, I owe you both so like i said if it wasn't for music matters jazz I, I would not have delved into Blue Note or any other jazz title as much as I did. That's fun. That was um, labor of love, to to put it mildly. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I love it. All right. Well, thank you for your time, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Thanks for asking us.